So last time um, we were in uh, notes number 14, um, down on the page that says uh, 265, and uh, we ended on about uh, the PDF page 9, which would be 267. We explored how to do this inversion uh, using a migration of the, uh, of the acoustic wave equation. And what we actually came up with uh, under a big set of assumptions, which are not too bad, is for, um, well, for, uh, for the really prominent assumption that we have constant background uh, rho naught and k naught. All right, so constant velocity, you know, as with Stolt migration, you know, thinking way back to the beginning of 706, <coughs> or the middle of 706, what we have is basically um, a uh, uh, in the Fourier domain, it's an omega stretch according to the double square root equation that gets us, and, and here it's expressed in uh, the GNS uh, uh, sorting in uh, for shot gathers, uh, and these um, <clears throat> kind of amplitude factors. So we've represented the whole in inverse algorithm as a um, <clears throat> as basically a Stolt migration and. It really is a Stolt migration because uh, Clayton got together with Stolt in 1981, and they published this in, in geophysics. So, um, uh, in um, it's a very simple procedure. Um, you know, it, uh, the added steps uh, on top of a Stolt migration. Well, you you do a 3D FFT uh, because your data are uh, in H, and you've got to transform to KH. <clears throat> You have to have some idea what your uh, source wavelet is, and you deconvolve that out, uh, which you can do by uh, spectral division. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, you have the same omega stretch. Uh, and so the funny business here that has to do with uh, estimating, you know, basically fitting the model uh, of delta k and delta rho to the data is this business of estimating uh, A1 and A2, those are the model parameters, uh, across uh, these uh, Km and Kz spaces. You know, by a least squares fit, you know, at constant values of Km and Kz, but you know, fitting the variance of the, uh, of the Fourier transformed complex amplitudes, fitting their, uh, their variance um, with uh, respect to Kh, K sub H. That's the offset direction. So you could think of that, you know, not as a stack, but as a fit to the, uh, if you like, a fit to the AVO. Of course, it's in KH, not in H. So it's, you know, I wouldn't call it AVO. Um, although in a way, uh, you know, what are you fitting in KH space? Well, if you have a um, some kind of variation, uh, you know, maybe it's a your AVO in H space would be really a, uh, a sine wave or a cosine wave, right? And so you'll have a, uh, a spike then on either the real or the, or the imaginary part of, the, um, uh, of this uh, KH uh, variation. So maybe that's, uh, maybe that's what we're doing is we're kind of fitting the, the AVO uh, variation waveform. If you want to think of it that way. Okay, uh, and then you know each of those you know estimated least squares fit um, a one and a two model spaces. They get transformed from k m to m and k z to z, and there's your two sections. Hopefully separating. You remember a one is uh, uh, delta k over k, and a two is is uh, delta rho over rho. So they're their uh, incompressibility and density variance, or variation. All right. So um, uh, we need to bring in a little bit more if we want to come out of the Fourier domain and be able to then think about lateral variations of velocity and curved rays and all those things that you can't handle with Stolt migration or anything like it. Just can't handle uh, in the Fourier domain. You can handle dip, but you can't handle lateral velocity variation. At least uh, there there were uh, 
there was a flurry of papers of people representing lateral velocity variation by um, various kinds of stretches. You know, there's the obvious um, time stretch you can do to uh, get rid of vertical velocity variation, approximately, and people tried it. Uh, tried stretching in X as well uh, before Fourier transforming to uh, mitigate uh, lateral velocity variation. But of course, that's all you know a very approximate and very kinematic process. And now that we're thinking about you know incompressibility and density separately, um, we've got to start getting away from the purely kinematic processes and think about you know how to represent properly the amplitudes that we've got. In our uh, in our seismic waves, um, and you know we've made enough of a compromise already by saying that our reflectivities, our uh, incompressibility, and our density variations, uh, our density perturbations have to be much much less than our back background, um, respectively, uh, incompressibilities and densities. So we've, we've already made that huge asymptotic assumption just to linearize it. And that should, you know, as long as we keep to that, uh, I mean, I've certainly used 50% uh, variation. But um, you know, if we can keep it down to 1% or so uh, um, uh, perturbation that's generating the reflections, then we have a chance of, of keeping amplitudes uh, correct. All right, so um, there's a uh, uh, to, to start getting towards this um, uh, this correct representation of amplitudes as well as phase. You know, we got the phase nailed right through our imaging conditions, through our travel times. Uh, I'll show you examples uh, through, through the double square root equation. You know, we really have we can really do a very good job on phase. Okay, and. So uh, there's a few more approximations that are very helpful in designing the forward and the inverse problems uh, that will allow us to get closer on the amplitudes as well. And these approximations are very, uh, very much accepted by our earthquake seismologist colleagues as well. Uh, and our earthquake seismologist colleagues are, are engineering seismology colleagues. They're the ones who are really going to be the sticklers on amplitude. Okay, because they worry about you know nonlinear large amplitude effects too, so they really uh, you know they have to get very far away from those simple um, ray theoretical assumptions that that say that you can get caustics and where uh, you know at the the focal point of a of a lens you know you can have infinite amplitude, right? That's obviously impossible. Okay. So um, uh, uh, we can adopt several of the uh, of the amplification of the simplifications that are that are very useful to the earthquake seismologists, and we can kind of follow them in terms of keeping amplitudes uh, under control as well. So uh, one of them that we need is this far field approximation. Uh, you know, the earthquake uh, seismologists um, until. Um, last month's SCEC meeting, basically everything that I had ever seen, okay, uh, about um, about uh, um, earthquake wave propagation, you know, presented at a meeting, uh, had assumed that you were standing outside and you didn't need to stand and and didn't need to worry too much about the inside. Of what you might call the earthquake focal sphere, okay, where all the nonlinear rock breaking and cracking and faulting and sliding and slipping is is happening. You stand off outside that focal sphere, which is, you know, a couple wavelengths um, away from the the epi the hypocenter of the earthquake, and everything that's happening there, uh, you just you can just linearly regard what's what appears on the outside of the focal, focal sphere, you can linearly regard that, um, and then just propagate it linearly, um, you know, away from there. Okay, 
And uh, Kim Olson's group has uh, finally um, done the work of, of saying, all right, if we have plasticity, you know, which is easy to get near the surface, and this is more than just Q, okay? Um, this is more than, way more than scattering, which is linear. It's uh, more than Q, which is nonlinear, but, but um, uh, you know, simple vis viscoelasticity. This is actual Prandtl plasticity, okay? And when your your um, your stresses are high enough, of course, uh, you lose a lot of energy to plastic deformation. Okay, and Kim showed us uh, some amazing um, simulations uh, where he'd taken his viscoelastic, you know, full scattering, uh, you know, full, you know, and very low Q in basins. Uh, Ten years ago, he had a result uh, from the uh, TerraShake. Uh, Simulations uh, done at Skek that said that there were these gigantic amplitudes, you know, from a southern San Andreas uh, earthquake that would rip through um, uh, rip through uh, San Gabriel Valley and and get funneled uh, through Whittier Narrows and and blast out across the LA Basin. Okay, when he put the uh, plasticity into the the fault rupture and actually carried out the con the uh, uh, the computation. The amplitudes dropped by half. Okay, the amplitude of shaking in the Los Angeles basin dropped by half. You know, there's still it's still dangerous shaking. There's no doubt about that. You know, we haven't been the seismologists haven't been wrong about that, but um, it's not up at the level of two meter per second shaking, which is what he was predict predicting in some places. I mean, a meter per second is bad enough. Okay, and and he shows that uh, you know if you actually come inside the focal sphere and you represent plasticity and get the amplitude more correctly according to the, the rock physics, then uh, you're, um, uh, you're putting some more limits on those, uh, on those ground motions. So that was the first time in my career that I've seen that actually done. And there's lots of arguments. There's lots more work to be done on that. Um, but, um, you know, this... Uh, this concept of standing outside the focal sphere, being in what's called the far field, several wavelengths away from any source, all right, that's been uh, a good mainstay, all right. Sorry for the diversion, but um, uh, and we're going to use that uh, as well. We're going to stand off. Um, we're going to stand off a couple of wavelengths at least from our sources. We're going to stand off uh, a couple of wavelengths away from the reflectors. We're not going to observe a reflector right at, um, right at the receiver or right at the source. We're going to stand off uh, just the same. Um, you know, we can't have we can't we can't put a reflector right close to a receiver. All right, uh, got to be several wavelengths away, and so of course that's a frequency dependent thing, uh, depending on depth. I have a question. Yeah. We only need to be one wavelength away, right? To have a reflection come back. Um, and the the Fresnel zone starts a half a wavelength away. Right, right. Um, I'm just thinking, like, to even image something. Yeah, yeah. What, what? And I'm hedging on this because there, there is not, there are not good rules of thumb for how far away you have, how many wavelengths do you need. To to make sure that the the plasticity effects have calmed down, okay, um, and that's one of the reasons why Kim's group decided to go ahead and just you know put it in, and it turns out that um, you know you got to be the effects of the plasticity, you know, get transmitted wherever the, the waves go. Okay, um, so it, it was a, you know, the, the Fresnel zone, you know, it's a very basic assumption, right? You got to stand off at least that far. Yeah. Okay. Um, I suppose, uh, I suppose when you stand off uh, for this southern, this new Southern California peta shake, uh, you know, with plasticity, <clears throat> if you're standing off on the other side of the continent, Okay, or in Hawaii, 
you know, then it, it you can't see the plasticity. All right. So um, uh, that's uh, uh, and that's a lot further than the than the Friedel zone, further than half a wavelength. Yeah. So so yeah, we, we you know all these years I've been hedging, and I say several wavelengths. Okay. Um, uh, and and uh, you know it seemed like the Fresnel zone was not enough. Um, so for instance, in, in the, the new migration code, there's a uh, min time. You know that's one way of standing off. And I've always set the min time to be uh, several wavelengths. Uh, you know, and you got to figure out what's your predominant wavelength and what are you trying to look at that sort of thing. Um, but I thought I was being overly conservative. And now maybe I, I think, maybe I wasn't being overly conservative. OK. So let's suppose our, our, our background, our reference medium, is smoothly varying. So the analytic WKBJ approximations for the propagation Green's function uh, G naught, big G naught, are valid. Okay. Now, in the far field, then we can apply Fermat's principle to find a unique ray under WKBJ of the unique ray of minimum travel time. So, you know, here we are are, are moving away. You know, by applying this far field approximation in WKBJ and saying, okay, we're gonna we're gonna take Fermat's principle. We're just gonna take those few waves that are um, in the in the minimum time ray, all right. That's where we're getting away from Feynman, and we're not summing everything. We're just summing rays, okay. Now now this is not going to be so so we're we're losing, you know we're losing uh, two or three integrals here, okay, uh, over what Feynman would do. You know, Feynman would still sum everything, every possible path, you know, and especially the ones that do not obey Fermat's principle. And we're going to say we're saying here we're going to throw those away, and um, and we're in the far field. We're going to apply you know WKBJ, which is basically ray theory, but correct for amplitude. And um, you know between any two points in the medium. There is this Fermat minimum travel time and array. Okay, um, so what are we giving up? We're giving up shadow zones. Okay, and and you guys have seen how much trouble the um, uh, the deterministic travel time calculators have with shadow zones and diffraction zones. Okay, uh, we're giving up multipathing. All right. Now uh, um, the the. Uh, and multipathing and shadow zones are related, uh, but not always. Um, we have seen multipathing in our, you know, when we use our, our deterministic travel times to calculate uh, ray paths, we can see the multipathing. So uh, we don't necessarily uh, have to give that up. Um, but uh, for, uh, for this assumption, we do. Okay. So it, this is, assumes that then. That the reference media and the ray set are amenable to ray, ray tracing. Okay, then here is a um, uh, an, an equation for the acoustic reflected wave field, and this is you know a well known. Um, uh, it's expressed here in terms that we use for reflection, but this integral equation is is uh, very well known in um, in in uh, earthquake seismology. Okay, so we have a, a reflective volume, or at least a volume of, ray, of uh, wave propagation, and here I'm only going to talk about its x and z coordinates. So the uh, x and z are members of, uh, of this this uh, cross section or or volume omega, capital omega, and um, you know it's a volume that has some. Uh, um, some reflectivity in it. Um, so the V there means both volume and, and reflectivity potential that I, that I added in. Here's our data. We're going to sum up 
everything that's going to make one seismogram. So that's that one seismogram comes at a uh, particular value of uh, of x sub s, a particular value of x sub g, and then for all time. Okay, or at least you know all time after the initiation of the source. Okay, so. Um, uh, what are we uh, what are we integrating together over this volume? Well, we're uh, you know somewhere inside the iteration, the integration. We are um, we're at one point of x and z, and there is a model property a one, which is delta k over k. And at at that same point x and z, there's a model property a two, which is delta rho over rho. Okay, now the um, so these are the these are representatives of the uh, of the reflectivity uh, potential. All right, you know these are the the uh, perturbations in k and rho, and why is there uh, a cosine? You know this isn't uh, this isn't the usual equation you're used to seeing for a reflection coefficient. Okay, there's a cosine theta here that's scaling the uh, uh, scaling the the a two. Um, scaling the uh, um, the reflectivity potential from from density variation. <clears throat> All right. Now I'm going to have to come back and explain exactly what that theta is and why the uh, reflectivity potential involves this cosine theta. Okay. That's basically the the theta is the angle between the incident and scattered wave. All right. Could be uh, you know anywhere between. Uh, uh, between zero and, and 180 degrees. Okay, zero is is backscattering. 180 degrees is forward is forward scattering. Okay, so you um, you multiply that that reflectivity potential by the time derivative of the source wavelet. Okay, and the source wavelet comes in late because uh, you know it's activated when you when you Get past the travel time from the source to the point, the reflecting point x and z, and you got to also subtract the travel time um, from the uh, from x and z back to the receiver. So t minus t s minus t g, right? That's our imaging condition right in there. Okay, so basically um, we're taking the time derivative of the uh, source wavelet, and um, and then. Uh, uh, we uh, we multiply that by the um, and so we have a wavelet there in, in time, okay, uh, so it's a differentiated and shifted um, and shifted uh, uh, you know it's a delayed uh, um, um, uh, wave. Uh, it's scaled by the reflection coefficient, which is a one plus a two times cosine theta, right there. And then it's scaled by these two a's. What are these a's? Okay. Well, this a here is a uh, simple ray theoretical geometric spreading amplitude coefficient. You know, basically, uh, uh, it's just saying how how much the wave front has expanded between the. Let's see. Uh, this one is between the reflect the reflector at, at x and z and the uh, and the receiver. Okay, and the receiver, of course, is at z equals zero. Uh, this one here is um, uh, this a is between the the source and the uh, reflecting point at x and z. Okay, uh, and then what are we integrating? Well, we're integrating over dx and dz. So this is this integration, this double integral, is just exactly a Kirchhoff sum over all the reflection points. Okay. And that produces, you know, one trace at, uh, you know, from the source at x s and the receiver at x g, and you know, being seismic surveyors, where we we have both our source and our receiver at uh, at the surface, but that's not necessarily uh, uh, that's not absolutely necessary. So this is um, this is basically. Migration style Kirchhoff modeling of reflection data. All right. Um, the uh, you know here's the uh, we'll, we'll come back to this. Uh, 
you know, the, there's the A's are the capital A's are the rate theoretical geometric spreading amplitude coefficients. Okay. Um, the uh, a1 plus a2 cosine theta is the scattering potential at that uh, x and z, and and you've got to involve, you know, the direction of the rays in this in this way, okay? And there's a1 and a2, all right? Uh, DDT times the uh, the shifted source wavelet, okay? Obviously it's shifted by the total travel time, right? Here's the Feynman diagram, okay? We've got uh, there's theta, the angle between the incident and the the reflected wave, wherever it is. Okay, so um, you know this goes by at, at least we're we're summing over, uh, integrating over part of what Feynman wants us to integrate over. Okay, um, you know we're only taking these rays, uh, right? So we're assuming that that <clears throat> all the energy we have to worry about. Um, comes along these rays and arrives at, at, at this angle and then leaves at this other angle, and the difference between those two angles is theta, right? And even in a 3D volume, right, uh, since um, the, it's always just, uh, just one angle here, right, no matter what the orientation of the, uh, of the, uh, the rays are in 3D, there's still just one angle theta between them at the reflecting point. Of course, we can allow the rays to bend. Um, so we're not um, we're not uh, we're not saying um, that uh, um, the what's received at this point is due to you know all and 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 if we were allowing multipathing, then we would have to say all right, what's received at this point, <clears throat> you know, could be due to a reflection. From the source down to some point here, and then to the to the ref, the reflecting point we want to assess, and then likewise taking it back back up, you know we could have uh, the whole volume of of multipath points, and you know we might have to. Uh, uh, I mean that's what what uh, reverse time migration and and full wave inversion actually do. They actually respect Feynman and integrate everything. Okay. Here we're we're saying all right Feynman we're we're only going to take this one ray uh, and then coming from the reflecting point uh, back to the receiver it's only one ray okay and it's a simple G naught it's a it's a direct ray that's this simple with this very simple geometric spreading and <clears throat> and it's not a crazy ray it's a, it's just a gently curved ray. <clears throat> um, so you know there there's definitely some simplifications here, um, but we are at least we are respecting Feynman insofar as we're at least integrating over all possible reflection points, and notice that we can have, you know, as we integrate over uh, you know lots of different, um, you know, say with this source and this receiver, you know, when we integrate in this reflecting point here, it's forward scattering. You know, theta is basically 180 degrees when the reflection point is way up here near the surface. We're including that, so you know we're meeting Feynman, uh, you know, uh, a quarter of the way. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, uh, uh, you know, and that's basically a uh, a migration. Okay. So this. Um, this forward born WKBJ far field reflection data, you calculate in a, in, a, in a technique that is, you know, basically a forward Kirchhoff migration. You know, migration is say uh, is like an inverse, and this is like a forward uh, 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 a forward process. We shoot rays through a smoothly varying model, and we integrate over a volume at depth. Here's just uh, illustration from uh, uh, Labrasse's uh, thesis, um, uh, showing the uh, reflectivity volume uh, uh, omega. There's uh, you know in three dimensions our our, our curved rays and our our uh, reflecting point x and the uh, angle of incidence. Um, well, it's the uh, the reflecting angle theta. 
um, we have uh, you know a T uh, T S T sub S, and uh, we have the uh, from the source to the reflector, and uh, A the amplitude uh, factor, you know, which is going to be uh, uh, less than one, right? It's geometric spreading, and here we have from the uh, from the reflecting point back to the receiver uh, under um, you know under uh, um, under reciprocity, right? You could call that uh, okay. Uh, we had a source at x sub g, and we got the travel time t two to the reflecting point, and the uh, uh, the amplitude factor, um, the geometric spreading factor, and that's exactly the same in both cases uh, for the wave that goes from the uh, reflecting point back to the receiver. Uh, here's uh, Ronan's uh, early synthetics. Um, he's got uh, source on the right hand side, and uh, this is a full wave acoustic finite difference. And here's the Born approximation. He has cheated. He's taken out the direct wave. Okay. So he's just showing you the re the, the reflected wave. Right, the Born approximation does not uh, does not calculate the uh, <clears throat> uh, does not calculate the the uh, direct uh, uh, wave. Um, here's a model that uh, um, that generated this. So uh, you know, in here, in this data are are you know all the uh, the features, um, and notice you know he's keeping it to five percent, right? The change in velocity is uh, is uh, just five percent from two to two point one kilometers per second, and um, and uh, notice he didn't include any density change in this one. All right, now how did he get the uh, how did he get the angle? Okay, and uh, you know so he used simple uh, ray tracing, and these are. Uh, uh, his display of travel time sections, you know, you can kind of see the time contours there. So from a source to the left-hand side, this is the uh, uh, you know 10 kilometer long section, 2.5 kilometers deep, <clears throat> velocity increasing with depth. Okay, so this is for a 1D velocity model. <clears throat> I think as you can see, um, this is the uh, travel time matrix. So you're familiar with those now. Um, Here's the uh, calculated amplitude decay. And then um, what else do you need to calculate um, theta? You know, and me, we may end up having to do this uh, at some point. <clears throat> you got to have the, um, uh, you got to have the, the, um, the angle that it comes into the reflecting point, And you got to have the angle that it leaves the reflecting point. OK? And so for a, uh, a 1D uh, velocity model, he calculated those as, uh, you know, here's a, this is a sign of the incident angle um, uh, section. You know, instead of a travel time section, it's a sign of incident angle section. Here's the cosine of the incident angle se section. So, you know, you sum together uh, uh, the travel times, right? This would be, you know, you use this uh, like in um, um, our, the Kirchhoff PSTM that we've uh, we've talked about. You use this uh, to get the travel time uh, from the uh, you know maybe the offset uh, from the the source to the uh, the reflecting point is so uh, uh, one kilometer, and you look down to the depth of the reflecting point. There's the time. You know, let's say that's one second. Um, from the source and then from the receiver to the uh, reflecting point, maybe the offset is five kilometers, and the, still at this depth, and maybe that's two seconds. So the total travel time T S plus T G is uh, three seconds. Okay, and you can do a similar thing by uh, working with the sine and cosine of the angles, right? So the reflecting point would have this sign here, whatever it is. Looks like it's uh, close to one. Um, and the uh, you know from the source and from the receiver it would be over here again close to one, um, and the cosine would be uh, you know this and then much less 
uh, for the um, uh, from the receiver. So using uh, those uh, four um, uh, the those four quantities, the two sines, the two cosines, you can calculate um, theta. Okay, and so that's how that's how Ronan did it. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> Uh, that's a, uh, a forward calculation, which uh, I think that's not really in the, his paper. It's in his thesis, mainly. Uh, a lot of other people were doing Born uh, modeling at that time. Um, so I want to um, start into uh, uh, wrote the LeBras and Clayton paper that uh, uh, inverts this. Okay, that. Uh, um, finds the transpose of the forward process and thus the tomographic inversion of the forward process. Inversion under the tomographic approximation, um, you know, which is uh, tomography, you know, projection from shadows. So this is a uh, <clears throat> 1988 paper uh, in geophysics as well. Um, and the, the Born linearization of the Ford problem really depends. That now I'm going to attack this amplitude, okay? And the whys and wherefores of this uh, <clears throat> of this cosine and the theta, okay? Um, we really uh, are relying on having a simple linear point, uh, simple linear amplitude response of a point scatter, okay? And the term that's uh, put forward, uh, you know, a1 plus a2 cosine theta, or you know, writing it out, delta k over k plus delta rho over rho times cosine theta, uh, that comes from a certain uh, uh, a certain set of asymptotic assumptions, uh, actually uh, put forward by uh, uh, K. Aki and uh, Liu Wu um, uh, thirty years ago. All right. So uh, for a point scatterer, you think about the reflection response as a radiation pattern from an effective point source. So um, and, and a radiation pattern is is a polar plot of amplitude, you know, or reflectivity, which depends on theta, which depends on that that you know incident versus. Uh, versus uh, uh, reflected angle theta, which varies from 0 to uh, 180. Okay? And you could also talk about it as, as going from 0 to minus 180. So uh, uh, one thing I, I'm hoping I can, I can lead you guys to understanding are these uh, Wu and Aki type plots that justify the um, uh, that justify the uh, um, the linearized amplitude response, the linearized reflectivity, right? This is a much simpler equation than the full. Um, oh, what is it called? Um, uh, the full Zopert's equation, you know, even for uh, um, even for uh, uh, the reflectivity of in, in an acoustic medium. All right. Um, you know, if you pick up a, a copy of uh, of Aki and Richards, you you can find uh, the Zopritz equations. You know, for p to p, p to s, s to s, s to s to p reflections, all listed on about uh, two pages of equations, two full pages of equations. All right, and uh, so so you know, Aki put that out there. Um, but he worked with uh, Lu Wu to um, uh, to simplify it, and the simplification, you know, under these asymptotic assumptions, again, you know, delta k is much much less than k, delta rho is much much less than rho. These asymptotic assumptions, um, you know, simplify uh, a half page equation down to just this, okay, just the uh, the cosine theta, really. So um, let's try to understand this this plot of the uh, of the effective point source. Okay, 
Um, we have, uh, uh, we're looking at cross sections here. And here's a flat reflector. Okay? So z is really pointing down. Okay? You can think of x as pointing to the right. All right? And this, this horizontal line in each one is a, um, is a flat reflector. Okay? Um, and so you know, we're, uh, we're seismic uh, surveyors. We're illuminating that reflector from above. Okay? And we have a, 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 an incident wave, and I'm tracing out the wave fronts here. The incident wave is, is, uh, um, is coming down. Okay? So now if I trace the ray, the incident wave is coming down. And it's going to hit this, uh, this point here okay, that's at the center. There's four different plots here. There are four different cross sections. Um, and they represent you know, isolated um, modes of reflectivity. Okay? So this polar plot here, which is a circle, okay, uh, and it's labeled with a plus. So that means that uh, um, it's a positive reflection coefficient, not a negative co reflection coefficient. Um, and uh, here it says delta k. All right? So when you have an incompressibility variation, all right. So we have a little nugget at the a ball bearing at the center of the of the plot here, along this flat reflector, right? So it's you know it's a it's a Huygens piece of that uh, of that flat reflector, all right. And we're illuminating it from above, <clears throat> and uh, and it's a delta k that's much much less than k, okay. Um, and this is the radiation pattern of the reflection. So it's as if the incident wave, working its way down here, you know, activates a um, an effective point source at that uh, at that diffracting nugget. Okay. So um, now, what is the uh, what is the radiation pattern of that effective point source? Okay, so we we hit it with a, a ray that comes straight down. Okay, and we get basically a um, uh, the response is uh, you know one times delta k over k. Okay, plus one times delta k over k. We hit it you know broadside. You know maybe uh, maybe it's my vertical fault at the San Andreas fault. A vertical reflector at the San Andreas Fault, near vertical fault plane reflector. We hit it from from the side at uh, 80 degrees. Okay, bounces off the nugget back towards our receivers way out here to the west, <clears throat> and um, it's also got a reflection coefficient of plus one times delta k over k. All right, we uh, we hit it from the top. And we uh, uh, we let it pass through, and the, so there's uh, it's not what we would call a reflection, but we could call it forward scattering. And get this, the forward scattering under this asymptotic assumption, and and you might call it you know in a, in an optical way you might call it transmission, right? The forward scattering from that nugget is again plus one times delta k over k. Okay. So the, the radiation pattern is a circle. All right. <clears throat> um, now, uh, uh, what kind of source has a radiation pattern that's equal um, all the way around? I mean, is this an earthquake double couple? Not hardly. It's a, it's a point explosion. So and, and does, does that make a little bit of sense? That uh, asymptotically, a change in incompressibility is going to look like a a virtual explosion, scaled, of course, by delta k over k. All right. So uh, you know k is the uh, modulus of a uh, volume change, and its asymptotic reflectivity response is a point explosion. Which means that it's positive in all directions. 
you hit it uh, uh, if 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 theta, you know, you have a, a wave coming straight down, and if it bounces off at a ninety degree angle, okay, and you're monitoring it way out to the west, you get you get exactly the same amplitude as if you have a normal reflection where it bounces off at zero theta, or normal forward scattering, where it just passes through the, the diffracting nugget. Okay? Point explosion. All right. What about a delta rho? Okay, a little more complicated. Now, now a change in density, um, its uh, effective point source is a is a, a point force. Okay, and so uh, and let's say the density goes up. All right. Um, you know, so uh, delta rho is uh, is positive, right? That's going that extra mass is going to push back on the wave. So we put a point force directed back at the incident wave. All right, we the wave works its way down. Okay, the normal reflection straight back up is plus one times delta rho over rho. The force is pushing back. Okay, um, but the force is is directed straight up. Okay, which means that the the wave works its way down, bounces off this point here, and what comes out at ninety degrees at theta equals pi over two? Nothing. You know this polar plot is zero. Okay. Uh, so, um, and what kind of function is that? Okay, so at zero, it's at zero theta, it's one. At um, um, at uh, uh, pi over two, it's zero. That's just a cosine. That's cosine theta. The uh, the reflectivity um, rendered by the effective point force, you know, pointed back at the at the at the wave, at the incident wave, is a is cosine theta. Okay. Now, what about forward scattering? Okay. Wave works its way down, and uh, and we get scattering forward scattering off the off the uh, um, the effective point force. Okay. And it's going to be minus and coming straight down. Still, the forward the the normal forward scattering is going to be. Uh, minus one, okay, times uh, delta rho over rho. All right, and then you know, <coughs> wave comes down, bounces off this way. It's going to be, you know, minus uh, uh, cosine forty-five degrees. All right, or which is of course the same as cosine one hundred and thirty-five degrees. Okay. So this this uh, this thing that looks like two circles, it's really just the polar plot of cosine theta, you know, and it's positive going back towards the source and negative going back uh, neg negative going forward to the uh, uh, in in forward scattering, and that makes sense because the uh, the point force is pushing back towards the uh, towards the source. Okay, so. Delta um, uh, delta k incompressibility variation point the effective point source is a point explosion. Um, delta rho um, density uh, variation, okay, that gives an effective point source. I, I'm sorry, effective point force pointed back in the direction of the incident wave. Okay. So the, the top left plot is basically you're saying it just spreads the energy in every direction equally. Yes. Partition. Yes. Right. And and here you know it's the same amount of energy going back as forward, none going to the side. Right. Same amount of, of energy uh, going back as forward, but the forward scattered energy is shifted in sign, shifted in phase.
All right. Now, you know, you can compute, right? Um, uh, impedance is uh, density times velocity. Okay, so you can compute the radiation pattern, which is going to be like a, a, a difference between these, right? So a, a delta impedance contrast, okay, is uh, uh, basically there's a little bit of side reflection, but there's no forward scattering. So if it's a pure impedance contrast, okay, which involves you know that has to be carefully constructed as a combination, the right combination of delta k and delta rho, pure impedance contrast, ah, it's what we expected, you know. The, uh, the normal reflection is the strongest. And as you get to uh, the forward scattering is nothing. And the, uh, um, the, uh, the side scattering is at 90 degrees theta is uh, you know, less than half. Okay? If it's a pure velocity uh, nugget, no... Um, uh, no impedance contrast, you know, again, a carefully constructed combination of delta k and delta rho to be a pure velocity contrast, it's all forward scattering. Just a tiny bit of, of you know, large angle backscattering. OK, I think I've given you enough to chew on here. Um, this, uh, uh, this Wu and Aki. Um, um, uh, simplification is is just brilliant. It's uh, it enabled us to make enormous progress before you know long before we had computers big enough to do uh, reverse time migration and uh, um, and uh, um, full wave modeling. You know, I mean full wave inversion. Okay, iterated full wave modeling. So. Um, uh, it's basically the linearization of the um, of the reflectivity, you know, versus the data, and and uh, uh, versus the amplitudes. All right. So um, uh, let's see. We're meeting on Monday. Is that right? Yeah. And so we'll um, um, we'll proceed, and I will. I've shown you the forward uh, calculation. Now I've justified the. Uh, the uh, reflection coefficient and the, the use of uh, the cosine theta. And then uh, we're going to see how to transpose this thing. All right?